Well, hello, everybody. This is Dr. David Jockers, and today we are going to do a movie review on What the Health. If you have Netflix, it's a very popular film that's on there, and basically this film is very controversial because they have a very strong health stance, which I'm all about, and there's some things I do agree with that uh, this, this movie, this documentary really brings to light. But we're also going to go into the science that is used for um, basically justifying certain slants and certain opinions on, um, on what the appropriate diet should be. And we're going to break that down and see if it really stands up to the test. So let's dive in What the Health Movie Review. And if you don't know me, my name is Dr. David Jockers. I am a doctor of natural medicine. I have a clinic just outside of Atlanta in a town called Kennesaw. It's called Exodus Health Center. And I speak all around the country and on various health summits on a number of different topics, including brain health, energy, and digestion. And this is my beautiful wife, Angel, my little boys, David and Joshua. So let's jump into this topic. And again, if you haven't seen this movie, um, it is on Netflix. You can also purchase the DVD, as you can see here on this uh, the book or the t-shirt <clears throat> and this movie really dives into you know chronic disease which you know we need more energy and attention from the mainstream press and on things like Netflix going into you know issues concerning diabetes and metabolic syndrome heart disease and cancer now one thing about the movie though is basically all of the experts that are in there are all promoting a vegan diet so they're all vegan diet promoters um, and, you know, and, and so that's basically it. And so one thing about this movie is it has a very, very strong stance that meat is the bad guy, that meat is the problem, meat is what's causing issues and, and health problems in our society. But the problem with this sort of a statement is that they only had quote unquote experts who promote that idea. So there, it wasn't balanced and that leads the viewer to believe that that truly is the problem, right? That that's, that's the issue, that there was no, you know, middle ground or nobody in a sense talking about the science that says that meat has health benefits. And so this is an issue. And so we're going to go into the actual studies about this, uh, you know, basically that, that go into this movie. But I think one thing that uh, I definitely agree with when it comes to the What the Health movie is, you know, basically the food we eat can either be the safest, and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. So it definitely brought attention to the idea that what we eat is definitely a strong contributor to developing chronic disease. You know, we all know people that ate a really healthy diet and develop chronic disease, so it can happen. But, you know, we know that nutrition, you know, the food that we put in our body the stress levels that we're under our overall lifestyle plays are 90, 95% of the role when it comes to um, preventing and even getting well from chronic diseases. And so let's jump into some of the main topics uh, that what the health basically talks about when it comes to meat. It says that meat increases cancer risk. Um, in particular, they talked about studies with colon cancer that we're going to go into that meat increases the risk of diabetes heart disease, obesity, inflammation, toxicity, and environmental devastation. So basically, um, what the health really, really just focused on meat, I think 90 to 95% of their attention was on meat and how meat is the bad guy. Meat is what we need to stay away from. Meat and dairy, I should say, animal products in general. And um, it's a very strong plant-based focus. Now, I'm, I'm all about eating vegetables. I'm all about plants in general. However, I really want to dive into some of the claims that they're make, making when it comes to meat because I'm also an advocate of consuming grass-fed, organic, pasture-raised, really good, clean animal products. And so if meat really was this big of a villain, I needed to know about it. So I dived into some of the research that the experts in What the Health um, use to justify their statements. And this is what I found. And so this is a big study. They, they talked about how colon cancer increases the risk of, I'm sorry, red meat, meat in general, processed meat increases the risk of colon cancer by 20%. And so this is the study that I found that indicated that. This is from a plus one 2015 study. And basically what they found was that the absolute risk, and I'm going to go through this, that there's a difference when you're reading research between absolute and relative risk. But the absolute risk 
of you basically we all have about a five percent risk of developing colorectal cancer affects, affects about one out of 20 people um and so basically when we eat processed meat according to this a meta-analysis this, this cohort study um basically what they said was that it goes from five percent to six percent so it's an increase of one percent one percent increase when we eat processed meat Okay, so that's basically what they're saying. Now they said 20%. And so if we think about that, what does that mean? That basically means that, you know, if 100 people, right, out of 100 people, 5% will, will develop colorectal cancer, cancer. If out of those 100 people, they're all eating meat, processed meat particularly, which I don't even recommend, that's going to be things like bacon and sausage um, and really processed meat. And they're not talking about you know, processed done correctly. But anyways, that increases your risk from five to 6%. So out of hundred people, it increases by 1%. So that's really a 1% risk, but they're saying a relative risk of 20%. And so if you were to take five to 6%, the difference there is 20%. It's a 20% jump from going from 5% to 6%. It's kind of like in this example here, if a new wonder drug reduces heart attacks from two out of 100 to one out of 100, okay, that's really a 1% reduction. So they really have a 1% reduction. However, the relative risk means that basically what is um, one divided by two, it's 50%. And so that's what they're going to do. So it's 50%. So one divided by five is 20%. So because the consumption of processed meat increases, our, our absolute risk by 1% and you take 1% over 5%, that equals 20%. So the relative risk can be advertised as 20%. And that's really what the experts say is that um, consuming a vegan diet reduces your risk of colon cancer by 20%. And so again, you can see how the science is twisted there. It's very, very small difference. And it's really controversial as well because of this study right here that came out in 2015, the same year as that plus one study, Journal of American College of Nutrition, they looked at 27, as a meta-analysis of 27 different independent prospective cohort studies. And what they found was that there was no significant association between the consumption of processed red meat and colorectal cancer. So even that statement alone, that increase by 1% absolute, 20% relative risk is highly controversial based on this very recent study that uh, that was in depth and looked at 27 cohort studies. So you know, we can't jump to conclusions based on that. You know, really what that comes down to is kind of this idea that says that as ice cream sales go up, and this is real data, the more ice cream we sell, the more violent crime we have in America. Okay, so the more ice cream we sell, the more violent crime we have in America. Now, is the violent crime associated or is it causing, I'm sorry, is the ice cream sales causing violent crime? That's the question we need to ask. So we see this association, all right, but is that actually the root cause? And what we know is that it's actually hot climate. When the temperature starts to go up, we sell more ice cream. People want ice cream as the temperature goes up. Well, also, as the temperature goes up, we tend to have a lot more violent crime, which I think has to do with dehydration would pro would obviously play a big role with that. Um, now, obviously, we could make an, an argument, we can make a, a you know reasonable argument that says, hey, more people are buying ice cream, that's more sugar, more processed dairy, more bad stuff into their into their body, right, causing blood sugar imbalances. When people have blood sugar imbalances, they get angry, they have shorter tempers, they have less control over their emotions. And they're going to end up having, you know, higher, higher uh, degree of violent crime. And so we could certainly make that argument, but it's actually, you know, an association. It's not a direct causation. And so when we look at the idea that red meat causes colorectal cancer, or causes cancer. What we have to say is, well, is it really the meat or is it the lifestyle that somebody who would eat processed meat? Um, is, is doing. Now, people who eat processed meat are, are typically not eating many vegetables, not eating much phytonutrients. They're also typically consuming, you know, a lot of sugar, like, like carbonated, you know, uh, soft drinks, uh, soda, different things like that. They probably are eating a lot of processed 
um, highly sugar ice cream. So all these types of foods cause massive inflammation in their body, yet that's not what um, what is talked about in the What the Health movie. And so one of the problems when we do disease-based or epidem epidemiological studies, cohort studies, is that they also rely on food questionnaires. So, and you can kind of pick and choose things based on these food questionnaires. So again, like we're looking at this and it's like, okay, these people eat more meat than other people. But the question is what kind of meat? And that these are the questions that aren't asked at this point in these sorts of studies. Because was it the nitrates? We know nitrates, which are preservative in hot dogs, are associated with cancer. We know that without a shadow of a doubt. And so if they're eating nitrates, clearly they're going to have problems. But what if they eat nitrate-free hot dogs? That question was not asked, wasn't brought up. You know, that's, that's something very important. How about what they put on the meat? So was it sugar, high fructose corn syrup in there? You know what I mean? Because obviously that's going to cause more inflammation in the body. Obviously, other filling agents, um, artificial sweeteners, you know, typically people that are eating processed meat are consuming aspartame and Splenda, different artificial sweeteners that are really bad for the body. Typically, the meat is cooked in high omega-6 vegetable oils like soybean oil or, co or co uh, corn oil or canola oil. And so all of these are increased trans fat consumption. You know, processed meat, they're not, again, what if there's antibiotics in that meat or hormones in that meat? That's going to affect that person's microbiome. What if it's the wheat from the bun, right? Or what if they're eating a whole lot of mutagenic meat, or I'm sorry, mutagenic wheat and um, a lot of gluten, then that's going to cause problems. How about the carbs and the potatoes? You can see all the different questions that we should be asking that we're not asking in these studies. And that's really the problem there is we can't just take this study and say, okay, because you know these individuals ate meat and they had a one percent absolute risk, higher absolute risk of developing colorectal cancer. Cancer that we should all just avoid meat. We've got to look deeper at that. We got to say, well, what else is associated with processed meat consumption? What what else can we cl more closely analyze to see what actually is causing the increased risk? If there is an increased risk, as we saw with the last study. And so, you know, we look at some of these other studies and, you know, this is, there, there were some other, and I'm actually going to go back to this slide real quick to explain this point, but there was a, um, this idea that sugar does not cause diabetes and, and what the health. And, and one of the experts there was talking about how sugar and, car and, and carbohydrates, um, Neil Bedard actually was talking about this, Dr. Neil Bedard, how that doesn't actually cause diabetes. And he said that it's really fat fat in the blood that causes heart disease, or I'm sorry, causes diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and issues like that. And so basically, here's the thing. We've got to actually take studies. There are studies that were done, like this is a 2016 study right here. And this is looking at basically a comparison between carbohydrate versus fat restriction on metabolic profiles. And you can see right there in the conclusion, okay, that Car restricted carbohydrate diet, that's the RC, restricted carbohydrate diet in overweight people with type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease has beneficial effects on all these different inflammatory agents. You can see high sensitivity, C-reactive protein was one of those factors. Um, let's see, they also talked about um, total antioxidant capacity. So it had beneficial impacts, even though we're reducing carbs. So that would mean like less fruit in the diet, things like that. It actually increased the total antioxidant capacity. It increased glutathione levels, and it also had a positive effect on fasting plasma glucose, right? That's what the FPG, HSCRP is a high sensitive C-reactive C protein. TAC is total antioxidant capacity, and then GSH is glutathione levels overall. And so all of those really, really positive things. And again, this is a November 2016 study, very recent. It was eight weeks of treatment um, on a restricted carbohydrate diet showed improvements compared with the high carbohydrate diet. So that's key. They were comparing it head to head, restricted carbohydrate diet with a high carbohydrate diet. Okay. Now they didn't give, you know, other details as far as, Hey, were people eating grass fed meat or people eating lots of vegetables? They didn't go into any of that. Most likely they weren't. 
Okay, most likely they were taking, you know, the the standard sort of restricted carbohydrate, more of like a, a Atkins style diet versus a high carbohydrate diet. Probably had a lot of grains, uh, and they didn't they didn't differentiate whether it was um, whole grains or not. But nevertheless, the restricted carbohydrate diet significantly outperformed the high carbohydrate diet. November 2016 study here. So, you know, we've got to look at stuff like this and say, hey, you know what? We can't um, just make, you know, we can't just make statements like um, fat in the blood causes diabetes. You know, this is another study right here. This is earlier in the year, March 2016. And you can see with this study, the conclusion was that a low carbohydrate diet, because they looked at a low carbohydrate diet and they took a look at basically um, people with metabolic syndrome. And what they showed was that people on this low carbohydrate diet were able to decrease the amount of fasting insulin, so the amount of insulin that was in their system, as well as the amount of insulin that they needed from medications. Um, they also reduced C-reactive protein, which is number one marker for inflammation, and they were able to lose weight. And so, again, you can see, hey, you know what? If it was fat in the blood, and these are people that are consuming higher fat, lower carbohydrate diets, then clearly they wouldn't get these results. So that's obviously not the case. And to me, it's really just common sense that diabetes is caused by consuming too much carbohydrate, which then causes an elevation of insulin because insulin's job is to take sugar out of the bloodstream and put it into the cells. Insulin actually is a life-saving hormone because if you don't get sugar out of the bloodstream, you end up with these um, glycolytic end products. They're called advanced glycolytic enzymes. AGEs that cause significant tissue damage. However, when we have high levels of insulin in the body, right, and we need that in order to take sugar out of the bloodstream if sugar is high, high insulin also triggers inflammation. It reduces liver detoxification pathways, so our ability to detoxify. It increases blood pressure by reducing elasticity of the, of the endothelial wall of the blood vessels. It'll increase particularly small dense lipoprotein particle cholesterols, right, which are the ones that are associated with heart disease, coronary heart disease. And so um, not the kind of cholesterol that we want to elevate. It also can cause neurotransmitter imbalances, increased amount of oxidative stress in the body. For men, it causes um, andropause, where basically it causes, it elevates this enzyme called aromatase, which takes testosterone and converts it into estrogen. So it causes this sort of andropause type of reaction. For women, it actually takes estrogen and turns it into testosterone, which can increase the risk of things like polycystic ovarian syndrome and other issues. And so keeping insulin under control and keeping our body very insulin sensitive is super key. This study showed that a low carbohydrate diet was very effective at improving insulin sensitivity. So we got to take that into consideration. We also know that in general, high sugar just damages every single organ system of our body. Yet the experts in what the health really said sugar is not the problem. That was one of their big statements is that, hey, sugar is not really an issue. It's really meat. It's really fat in the blood. But I mean, the science is very clear that sugar damages brain function, increases our risk of depression by 58%, damages the heart, the endothelial walls of the blood vessels, causes problems with the skin like acne and eczema and different issues like that, um, damages the kidneys. You know, when people have diabetes and they have uncontrolled high blood sugar, they typically end up developing kidney disease, um, affects our genitalia. We talked about sex hormones and how it affects that. Also increases inflammation in our joints leading to osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis as well. So just chronic joint pain. And so right here, you can see a 2017 study that looked at red meat and heart disease, because this is another issue that was brought up in the movie was that consuming red meat, really meat in general, but particularly red meat increases our risk of heart disease. Well, this was a study June, 2017. So very, very recent, and you can read this abstract, right? And it talks about basically how there was no association between red meat. In fact, the, in the conclusion, they said, there's no significant relationship between red meat and heart disease risk based on what they found um, looking at this review of literature on red meat. And so, you know, more or less, again, this, this sort of statement that has become 
part of the zeitgeist of our society, this idea that, hey, red meat increases your risk of heart disease is not actually founded on science. It's not actually true. And we look at cultures of people that consume a high animal product diet. We look at the Maasai. They live on meat, milk, full fat milk, and blood from cattle. And they consume a lot of butter as well. 66% of their diet is saturated fat and they have very low rates of heart disease. The Inuit, um, they're eating a lot of whale blubber, and they have a 75% saturated fat diet. They don't die of heart disease. You have the Rendell, 63% saturated fat. Again, very similar diet to the Maasai, and they are not dying of heart disease. Very healthy tribes, by the way. And the Tokelu, who consume a lot of fish and coconut, 60% saturated fat because they're consuming a lot of coconut, a lot of palm oils, and they don't die of heart disease either. And so ultimately, what do we have to really look at with this? We've got to look at how to make, how to set up the proper diet. You know, here's a big thing. We've got to reduce sugars and grains because that increases blood sugar, increases inflammation, increases insulin, and causes insulin sensitivity. We need more good fats, things like avocados, olives, coconut products, um, grass-fed butter. These things are really, really good sources of fat. We want to get rid of the bad fats. It's going to be things like corn oil, soybean, safflower, cottonseed oil. These are really bad, bad things. And then when it comes to meat, we want to change the meat that we eat. We want to get rid of commercial animal products, processed meat I'm not a fan of. Um, so commercial animal products that are, you know, put, that have antibiotics, um, that are associated with antibiotics, they eat GMO corn and soy, and oftentimes of hormones pumped into them. We want to avoid that. We want to go with grass-fed, organic, pasture-raised animal products. And there were uh, discussion about how basically consuming meat causes problems with our microbiome and that, that it also is loaded with heterocyclic amines as well as dioxins. Well, to go into that, number one, dioxins are going to be found in the commercial animal products, but not in the grass-fed organic animal products. So that's number one. Number two, heterocyclic amines are definitely caused through the cooking of animal products. And this is where a lot of meat-eating people go wrong is that they barbecue their animal products and they do it with really high heat. And when you do it with really high heat, you create smoke. That smoke is full of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, these PAHs, which are known carcinogens, really, really toxic stuff. And then on the actual meat, so when we consume the actual meat, there are heterocyclic amines, which cause massive inflammation and reactive oxygen species in the body. So the way that you reduce that is you marinate it. So you put in things like, you marinate it in things like olive oil, apple cider vinegar, or lemon or lime, which have vitamin C and bioflavonoids that are really helpful. Um, you can put in herbs like garlic, basil, oregano, thyme, onion, right? These types of things in your marinade are going to reduce the amount of heterocyclic amines that are formed when you're cooking the meat. And on top of that, so now you have your barbecued meat, but you did it properly and you cooked it at a lower temperature. I want to say that too. You want to, when you barbecue it, cook it at a lower temperature for a longer period of time rather than a high temperature where you're producing a lot of burn marks. And then you consume your barbecue with vegetables, right? Ideally. So you're consuming a salad with it. <coughs> Excuse me consuming a big salad with it, some sort of healthy vegetables, ideally raw vegetables or lightly steamed, not barbecued vegetables. So you're getting a lot of polyphenols, a lot of antioxidants. They're going to help reduce the heterocyclic amine, um, the, 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 the negative effects of the heterocyclic amines that may be on that protein source. So this is basically how you negate that. Okay. Now, as far as the microbiome concerns go, okay, there are actually studies that show that consuming high good fat along with consuming vegetables has a positive effect on the microbiome. All food that we eat is going to cause inflammation. Anything we eat, even eating vegetables can cause some inflammation. And so in general, that's why I'm a fan of intermittent fasting, okay, and also consuming our animal products with vegetables because that combination will help to have a positive effect on our microbiome, help reduce the overall microbial load in our system and help our strengthen our gut so we're not producing bad compounds 
um, from the gut microbiome. Now, another source of animal products that got a bad rap in this movie was seafood, okay? And they talked a lot about heavy metals and mercury and different toxins. And so I definitely recommend avoiding seafood that's high on the food chain. So that's going to be things like... Um, like shark, for example, and swordfish. And then also I'm a, I'm, I'm a fan of reducing or eliminating shellfish as well, shrimp, lobster, things like that. They are known to suck up more toxins. But what I am a huge fan of are the right types of seafood sources like wild Alaskan sockeye or king salmon, which is super rich in omega-3 fatty acids as well as this antioxidant called astaxanthin. Um, Pacific sardines, right? Sardines are awesome. Anchovies, herring, these are all low, low on the food chain. So low mercury content, wild caught cod, wild caught whitefish, chunk light tuna, not the albacore. Albacore has much higher levels of mercury, but chunk light is much better to consume. And in particular, things like sardines, the salmon, anchovies, very high in omega-3 fatty acids. Those are really our best sources, but herring, wild caught cod, white fish and chunk light tuna are also good sources of protein and things like selenium, which is a trace mineral that's very important for reducing heavy metals like lead and mercury. So getting good selenium, which um, seafood is one of the best sources, high quality seafood like this is a great way to reduce heavy metal exposure inside of your body. Okay. So let's break down fats to eat. We want to consume we only want to cook with saturated fat. This is really key. So coconut palm oils, um, MCT oil, butter, ideally grass-fed butter, because um, when cows eat grass, they get a lot more antioxidants and things like conjugate linoleic acid uh, into their dairy, and that's what we want to consume. Ghee, which is clarified butter, tallow, which is beef fat, schmaltz, lamb fat, duck fat, grass-fed dairy, eggs, meat, and seafood. So these can all be cooked, okay? Um, unsaturated. Now these are ones we don't want to cook with. Okay. So we want to use these raw or else they denature under heat. So that's olive oil, olives and avocado oil, nut oils like walnut, pecan, macadamia, or just any nuts and seeds in general. We don't want to cook those. If we do roast them, we want them to be lightly roasted. Okay. Now I've heard olive oil or avocado oil withstands heat at a higher temp. I still wouldn't cook with it because it is a monounsaturated fat. So by, by nature, it can be denatured, whereas coconut oil is really just mostly all saturated fat. By nature, it can't be denatured. So that's important to remember. Okay, what do we want to avoid? Margarine and hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils. And I think, you know, even the experts, the, the plant-based experts on what the health would totally agree with that. Let's stay away from margarine hydrogenated oils, trans fats, things like that. Let's also stay away from things like canola oil, corn, all these vegetable oils, soybean oils, grape seeds, sunflower, safflower, rice bran, cotton seed, sesame, peanut. These oils, we definitely want to avoid. We want to stay away from those. They are toxic and bad for the body. So this is basically when it comes down to these fats is what we want to be focusing on. Now, the last thing I'm going to discuss is the effects on the environment Okay, and so there's a lot of talk about how consuming meat is destructive to the environment. But actually, believe it or not, there's something called regenerative agriculture. And regenerative agriculture is very much um, dependent and, and highly, um, it's, it's really promotes using animals because animals, if they consume the right foods like grass, grass-fed cow, for example, will then poop and that poop is manure it's um compost that helps produce healthy soil and so really farmers that know how to do this right like joel salatin like jordan rubin um, basically what do they do they go ahead and they rotate the cattle or the chickens or whatever it is to different areas so they don't over consume one area and and basically uh, tear down the plant matter in that area, but they break it down enough. They also stomp on it. They poop on it. They pee on it to where now all of that can be recycled into the ground and create really healthy topsoil. And then they bring those cattle to, you know, another part of the farm where the grass is long, they've got lots to eat. And it's kind of this continual cycle of rotating these animals 
around, which actually creates healthier soil and healthier um, agricultural practices. And so regenerative agriculture actually very much depends on things like grass-fed animals, okay? And um, by actually consuming grass-fed organic animal products, pasture-raised chicken, we actually promote this sort of practice. It's actually one of the best things we can be doing for our environment is consuming these sorts of animal products. Now, when it comes to animal products, I'm a huge fan of not overdoing it. I would recommend, you know, consuming, for example, grass-fed beef or something like that once, maybe once a day, um, where you're consuming meat because it can be challenging on the digestive tract. All right, and consuming a lot of smoothies, which I'm a huge fan of. You guys have probably heard me talk about that before, and protein puddings and different things like that, which can be awesome. But in general, um, the the whole idea here is that consuming healthy grass-fed organic animal products is actually very good for the body and should not be looked down upon, does not increase your risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, or any of these other degenerative diseases. What we want to avoid is sugars and grains, bad fats, and commercial animal products, and really focus on good fats, low-carbohydrate diet, lots of non-starchy, antioxidant-rich vegetables, lots of herbs, and healthy grass-fed organic pasture-raised animal products. So hope you guys got a lot out of today's training on what the health. Love to hear your comments, and be sure to subscribe and, and go to my um, my website, drjockers.com, where you can download my free digestion energy quick start guide and my 10 fat burning dessert recipes. And we'll see you guys on a future online training. God bless everybody. Bye-bye.